Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. And thank you for allowing us to do work that we find meaningful. Thank you for giving us the most valuable commodity you have, your attention. We promise to do our very best to give you a return on it. Today, we have Trader Ferg of TraderFerg.substack.com. We're going to pick his brain on our favorite commodities and answer your questions. Ferg, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Steve. Pleasure to be here. Well, well pleasure's show. all on this side of the table, sir. I, uh, I've, I've, I've been looking forward to this one. Well, I've been binging a few of your interviews recently, yeah, particularly Matt Water. I was just yeah, started one and then found, found myself watching them back to back. So yeah, they, they were absolute quality. Yeah, so thank you for putting them together. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it Matt definitely carried the interview on that one. Those have been some of our most successful episodes in that both of them just consistently get like 50 downloads a day. And, you know, usually there's a plateau on those, but but this, it's just a solid, uh, you know, 20 degree arc just continuing to go. So, uh, yeah, Matt really knows his stuff and I feel grateful that uh, that I met him. Yeah, well, this will be a disappointment then, so I'll, I'll, I'll balance it out. <laughs> 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 we'll steer away from coal after having yeah having met on yeah just just dodge the coal questions <laughs> right all right well let's uh this is your first time on the show uh let's uh just tell us your story how you got started how you got into trading and how that led to where you are today certainly so um i'm a kiwi i grew up on a, a sheep and beef farm in new zealand thought i was going to be a farmer went to a agricultural uh, university, decided it wasn't for me and pivoted into um, finance and property and took off to Australia where I worked in asset management for most of my 20s, where I was lucky enough to meet my mentor to this day, um, Brad McFadden, and he's a fund manager, took me under his wing, kind of taught me everything I knew. I managed to um, quit my asset management job by the time I turned 30 and then just manage some money for high net worth people for another few years in Europe and then decided kind of that wasn't for me either and by chance um, met my sister in Bali uh, for a holiday and fell in love with it soon after met my now wife and coming up seven years here now <laughs> so been living on the beach uh trading full time and yeah that's and now i have a have a have a son and a dog and a house <laughs> and, and a white picket yeah. fence <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> good for you so you've you found a mentor who had done what you wanted to do before you basically uh, rode his coattails and learned all that you could from him and now you're you're trading stocks on the beach Yep. Yeah. No, I experimented with a lot of styles and wasn't till I saw his style of just digging through really bombed out sectors. And I, I think it's so important to find someone that just resonates with you and the way he saw the markets, the way he approached stuff, the way he kind of develops conviction and then really holds stuff for a long period for it to really get a chance to run. That just suited me um, down to a T and I, um, really latched onto it and have um, yeah had some success with it over the years. How do, how do you find the most hated like unloved uh, bombed out sectors? So it's a mix of stuff. It's he he puts a lot of weight in kind of um, viewing like papers, magazines for um, sediment. Like what's the most hated? Um, like a good example would be I think making cold history was uh, on a magazine cover and forgetting whether it was business week or, and then you've also got charts that the classic chart is the, the sort of almost bubble to a, a blow up and then sort of bottom crawling for years. Um, once you see that chart, then you ask like, is that sector cyclical? What would need, we need to see to, for that sector to turn around? Often they end up in a bankruptcy cycle, which is um, I think one of the biggest gifts if you can, you have conviction that it is going to prove to be cyclical over longer term and you can get in um, with a lot of the um, the debt removed, restructured, still have um, sort of assets for cents on the dollar and a lot of them end up with um, debt for equity swaps. You're in there with what was previously the senior debt holders. So you're kind of 
one of the few times in markets you can actually be shoulder to shoulder with kind of the smart money as retail. Okay. So when you see a chart that is just completely uh, uh, grenaded, then um, then that's when uh, <laughs> that's when you know you're there. I, I, I was going to yeah. try to pull up an example here. Here's Nat Gas. Uh, would that be an example right there of just a completely bombed out and this might pique your interest? Is it? So it's, it's more, I call them like bottom crawlers. Like a example would more be, I'm trying to think of a company that would be like kind of like Transocean. If you pull up that chart and zoom out, that's that's like the typical. Um, okay, what, what's their ticker? Like, uh, RIG, um, R-I-G. Oh yeah, I've looked this one up before. Yeah, like the absolute uh, hated. Yeah, yeah, like just that's it's, the it's chart. a it's a patient that is dying on the table and they're flatlining. Exactly. That, okay. That's the, and and a lot of these went bankrupt. So this is this is one of the few that's actually got like the history. If you look at like Valaris, Noble, Cedril, they all got quite a short history because they all um, went into Chapter Eleven and have only jumped out in the last few years. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that one is interesting. It, uh just flatlining. Okay. Um, all right. We got a lot of questions here from a lot of different listeners. Uh, we're, gonna, we're probably not going to be able to get to all of them, but uh, we will do our best. Uh, let's, uh, let's start off on uranium, Ferg. And Raul yeah. wants to know uh, your thoughts on the uranium majors. Uh, so the two 800-pound gorillas in the room, because Adam Prom and Cameco. Yes, I, I watched them carefully because... Well, to start with, the uranium market's so small that you, you can get a lot of um, good signal from them, considering, I, th I think, between them, they're about just under 60% of um, production. And so when you consider that, like, keeping an eye on their CapEx, keeping an eye on their sort of, um, are they are they meeting guidance? And for anyone that's been paying attention recently, <laughs> they've obviously both been struggling, which is kind of pretty ominous for how are we going to close this um, demand supply gap moving forward? Like if you take, if you take, because Adaprom, it's kind of fascinating that they um, have misguidance uh, by the amount they have, like 10, 10, 10 million um, pounds. And what's, and, and I think they do it again next year on 20, 2025 guidance. And that, that in such a small market is just, it's kind of incredible. Like I was trying to, I was trying to work out the um, when I first um, saw that happen. I was like, what, what does that represent in terms of all the the little guys that we know are going to start to bring production on? Like, how how much of that is going to wipe out? Say, um, so yeah, I, I like looked into it, and I think it to to put it in perspective for twenty four. If you would take what Paladin Boss um, Energy Fuels URC uh, uh, you are you are energy, I think, and Uncle are all aiming for that would be seven million pounds, and because out of problems, just <laughs> taking that. Yeah, off the they're table. just removing that off. That, yeah. that's that's a non thing after missed that, guidance. That's done. Yeah, that's done. Yeah, and then I believe that'll happen again next year. And if you take all of those companies, what they all aim to have ramped to, that would be another twelve million. So you pretty much wipe that out again. And so we're not we're not closing that gap at all. Uh, Chemico is also not not quite as bad, but it's also missing um, missing guidance in the sort of ten percent range um, recently. And so you arrive at this kind of, and they're trying to essentially they're having to buy off spot, which is just absurd when you consider like I don't know what an analogy would of that would be would be kind of. Like the Saudi Aramco of the um, world, like having to actually go and buy oil to supply to meet contracts, it's just everyone's short. And this is, it's still, I still love the trade. It's still the majority of um, my portfolio, and I don't see how this doesn't end with something pretty crazy. Because until I can see, until I can see that supply demand being closed, like if, if you. I think it was Riaz Rizzi. He was um, he was the chief operating officer for Kazaprom. He was quoted as saying, "Like, you need two um, whole Kazaproms by 2030." And if you if you go through all the um, 
early stage um, developers, um, everyone that's supposedly going to bring a pound on, take them all at their word, add it all up by 2030. You still don't, you still don't um, patch the current supply demand gap. And that's before you add in the financial entities, which are <laughs> going to try and hoover some up themselves and make that gap even wider. It's before you even kind of get a bit more, uh, drag out some of the sort of, add some of the Chinese demand, potentially SMRs um, by 2030. And so it's, it's kind of crazy when there isn't a clear path to that gap being closed. And so, yeah, I think it gets crazy. And I do keep a close eye on those two because if they can't, um, it was, because out of problems, just cost inflation has been pretty substantial. Like if, if those guys can't keep it under control, like what, what chances sort of a, um, a developer in Africa or something can have, right. have like yeah. kind of secure, <laughs> secure staff, like yeah, have um, yeah, specialized labor will be extremely difficult. No one knows how to build a mine. <laughs> like one of the stats I love was, uh, John Borstoff reminds everyone whenever he's been interviewed that he was the only one that actually brought a um, sort of a, a um, developer right through to production. Everyone promised last cycle that is without being acquired by a major or in a JV, um, Paladin was the only one. So when, I, when I'm pointing to all these promises of bringing pounds on, um, if history is to be like, they're, they're not, it's a hard game. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if they undershoot pretty significantly. So yeah, it's, I find it fascinating still. Okay. So you, you look at uh, those two, because Adam Brom and uh, Cameco is kind of signals for the market because they're something like 60% of production. Uh, both of them missed yeah. their guidance because Adam Brom uh, more than Cameco, but irregardless uh, to make up just what they missed would take half a dozen good juniors <laughs> to make that up. That's it. Um, so it, the bet is still on, uh, is is what I'm hearing you say. Are, are you placing any new bets, or or did did you get your money on the table three four years ago and you're still just riding the wave? Yeah, so I'm I'm a real cheap bastard when it comes to getting positioned. I like to get in when it's absolutely bombed out. Everyone hates it. No one wants to touch it. That's when I get most excited about a sector. I like generally moved on by the time there's a lot of froth and excitement. So any, anyone can look back at my, my old website. I set up a blog during COVID and just wrote about um, everything that interested me then. And that was, that's what I was seeing then was like, I, th I think it's traderfer.com. It's it was running on fumes. And I said, like, I'm like, I'm very smart, but I don't understand how this, this supply demand gets, closed and so i'm just gonna go with a what i thought was the biggest no-brainer at the time and go with um mines that i thought would be an easy restart i didn't want to bet on something that i i've got no idea if they can execute to bring it into production so i just sized uh paladin which was just a simple mine restart it had already been in production previously and boss and then um and pretty much haven't added a position for years now in uranium but uh yeah, yeah, the only thing I have done in the last few years is participated in uh, private placement for Alligator, and that was just to get some warrants. But yeah, other than that, I haven't, I haven't bought a uranium stock in quite a while. Okay. Have you trimmed your position? No, no, oh, not yet. Okay, I, that's conviction. I, I, I have quite a clear like um, set of signals to exit. Like I, I have this whole um, whole philosophy around when you go into cyclical sectors, you have to have a very clear exit plan. And the way I go about that is I have uh, just a number of signals, some of the market related, some sort of more behavioral related, and each um, will involve sort of slightly scaling out. So maybe a 5% slice off if I see um, something occur. And so I'll just gradually take myself out of a market. I've, I've put this in writing twice now. I, once on my old blog, it's called the monkey trap. And that's just the idea that... Um, is sort of a trap that hunters use. I think it's in Africa and it's just a, um, not in Africa, it might be in Asia, but they use a coconut and make a small hole in the coconut that's just small, small enough to get the monkey's fist in. And then they attach the coconut to a tree, fill it for, full of nuts, and the monkey can just get his hand in the hole. But once he grabs the nuts, he can't get his hand back out. 
and the hunter can just walk up and the monkey's own greed gets him killed because he refuses to let go of the nuts. And so I was using that as a analogy for refusal to miss any gains will get you killed in a sort of a commodity bull market. So you have to be prepared to scale out, miss gains, and you'll probably miss a lot at by the top, but there's no way you can pick the top in something like this. So just gradually scaling out over time is the only way you can do it. You can you can try and top pick, but ideally you'd only have sort of 5%, 10% of your portfolio left if you're going to be a hero with that. And that makes the game quite interesting as well because there's a lot of great sectors out there as well that can um, shift those funds to. And so that's what I spend a lot of my time looking at now is like, where am I going to push all this capital um, as I scale out? And uh, as you, uh, so basically you're going to be taking off the top, as the signals start hitting, you're going to be taking 5%, 10% as, uh, as these things come to fruition. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, YZ and Cody uh, are curious about uh, Niger and the recent uh, Iran deal. Can you ask Ferg's opinion on the current situation in Niger, as, you know, Global Atomic and uh, GoBX? Yeah, so that's just a, a rolling shit fight. It's, um, yeah, it's it's frustrating. I'll sleep a lot better when I'm out of African miners, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> I, I, do, I do think that's a gets into production. Um, I just think the, the main issue with all this is obviously the financing. They, they still have to get the financing package um, of Global across the line. And with all this uncertainty, that's kind of making it super difficult for any sort of uh any bank financing really and so that kind of unless unless there's enough certainty they can get that done it really only leaves kind of jvs and worst case equity and that's that's why you kind of seen it get smashed is the idea that maybe a chinese entity could really um take advantage for a jv like kind of if, if they get desperate enough um could get a great price on that and i think Obviously, the worst would be them having to um, issue equity um, at a at a really depressed valuation to um, to progress, and so it's just a pity because it's such a such a great mine, it's such a great resource, and it's just yeah, it's just frustrating that every time they seem to get traction, something else happens that gets smacked again. Um, yes, I, I do own Global, uh, but I don't own GoBX. I'm in the same boat. I own Global, but not GoBX. Do you, do you see a um, a risk of uh, what's what's the word uh, risk of our big thinkers, like what happened with the uh, Gazprom or Polymetal, in that you know because it was Russian, you, you, all of a sudden your assets are freezed and it just went to shareholder heaven. Do you, do you see something maybe similar happening with the you know through the ethos because Iran is involved though the <laughs> we could just all of a sudden no longer be owners of uh, global atomic never never say never in an African country I'll tell you that <laughs> like, <laughs> anything's possible it's position sizing that matters here because it's yeah anyone that pretends to have any real insight yeah you're kidding yourself you've just got to yeah. set a position size that limits your loss and accept that if if the worst comes, like I, I know some people have watched that their entire uranium position is global atomic, and I just think that that's nuts. That's absolutely <laughs> crazy. I don't They're know. either I going don't know to how... retire in two years or not. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I don't know how they sleep. Yeah, that that would that would yeah that would freak me out. So um, yeah, I ultimately I, I still think it's good risk, risk reward. Um, I just think you're going to have to be patient and you going to have to accept that there's going to be a lot of bumps along the road and there is definitely potential for their hand to be forced if things keep getting worse they might have to accept some sort of a less than ideal jv or hopefully not issue have to issue equity to get it across the line yeah okay okay all right let's move on to energy uh oil gas and coal uh, what is your macro view of the oil and uh, gas market? Yeah, so I come at this from the sort of the, the big macro view is that I believe we're always underestimating demand um, for fossil fuels. And this is it's largely 
there's two big narrative or one big narrative that I think is completely overblown and that's that the sort of um, trend we're transitioning away from them which I don't see happening at all I think the EV adoption rates are um, going to severely disappoint moving forward I think the whole sort of 50% renewables by 2050 that's not going to happen either it just um, does not make sense and we're going to see um, fossil fuels continue to um, increase and that's largely based on sort of developing market growth. Like one of, one of my favorite charts to show is how wrong the IEA has been year after year on uh, oil growth. So every year they underestimate uh, the uh, oil consumption by a million barrels a day and then they have to revise and they've done this for like a decade. It's the craziest chart when you see them just constantly wrong, wrong, and then they they never learn. And it's it's essentially like the um, developing markets, particularly India and China, are climbing. It's known as the S curve. They're just trying to increase their standard of living. And so, one of, one of the problems we always have in the West has been quite sort of Western centric with our view, like thinking what we experience is. Um, is kind of how the world works. Whereas like the way I always like to state it is um, the West is call it 1.6 billion and we consume 13 barrels um, per person per year. Whereas developing countries are uh, 6.4 and they're consuming only three barrels per person per year. And what's wow. interesting is in the West population growth is going nowhere. Yeah. So yeah, we, we can, we can certainly maybe save, uh, take our consumption from 13 down to 12 and pat ourselves on the back. But the real story is the fact that in developing countries, they're going to add 2 billion people um, by 2050. So that's two, 2 billion more people consuming their three barrels per, uh, per person per year. And they also, they're trying to increase their standard of living so that they're trying to pull that um, three barrels to four barrels so that they can, um, have some of the, the luxuries that we enjoy in in um, developed world, and that's always been the sort of framework. And you can look at this going any long term energy chart is just for energy demand is um, it's not a trend you want to bet against. And so that's every time I see someone sort of forecasting um, fossil fuels to roll over, I essentially want to take the other side of that, and then. So that's that's the demand side, and then come back to the um, the supply side. And the supply side's been interesting because been pretty wrong recently with leaving. Uh, the, the game really is around um, can shale um, keep holding up production and keep growing, and that that's every, everything's essentially revolving around the permian at the moment because that's that's where much all the incremental growth come from the last decade and um, if that rolls over the shale declines are pretty damn steep and so believe yeah it can't keep up with the sort of energy demand um, that I see out in the future and I think we're going to have to um, we're going to have to go offshore we're going to have to um, find a lot more oil uh, to replace that and that's that's kind of my basic supply demand um, view. I think the moment, if um, short term, it's pretty rough outlook because we've uh, had some pretty warm weather. So a lot of the um, there's a lot of sort of essentially, if you're talking gas or coal, um, a lot of storage was carried through the winter from um, two to super warm winters and and also quite windy winters in Europe as well. So not only was there not a large requirement for heating, there was also uh, quite a lot of additional power generated through um, through new renewables. And that's meant that it came out of European um, winter with 60% storage, which is crazy. Um, so a lot of the coal inventories will probably get, um, get dumped. China has um, a decent glut of coal in the US. Um, US is the same, quite a warm, um, winter and so the short term doesn't doesn't look all that um, all that rosy but I think if you um, 
if you um, zoom out, I think it's um, still still very asymmetric setup and I'm still continued buying. I love my offshore um, oil plays. I love the coal plays for the longer term. Um, I just don't don't expect any any fireworks in the next year or so. Okay. So basically you're saying that uh, we've uh, uh, underestimated uh, demand and um, <laughs> despite what our big thinkers are saying, uh, we're, we're not going to use less, less oil and gas. We're going to be using more of it as much as they want to uh, have us all on uh, wind farms and solar panels. That's, that's not going to happen. Uh, China and India are probably going to be the biggest consumers. They're climbing the S curve, which basically means that they, they would like to have the standard of living that, that you and I enjoy. And uh, in order to get that, they're going to have to increase their, uh, their oil production. And um, yeah, you like the bet. You may see some short-term pullbacks over the uh, next year or so, but long-term, this is a no-brainer. Yeah, exactly. Just the, and, and the valuations also, this isn't, often people get mixed up between the, um, having putting too much weight in the macro, whereas a lot of the valuations kind of, kind of like coal, coal's a perfect, example of this like you can spin sort of the macro on coal um a lot but ultimately it's just crazy value as well like it's if you have something trading at two times cash flow like it's hard hard to go too wrong and buying back its own stock it's like the um need to reach my um alpha <laughs> Met resources <laughs> like uh, like matt water does is pull on a cap with uh, one of the coal names doing buybacks yeah i i just and that's such a yeah those are those things are no-brainers and especially when you see it, it doesn't get reported um this is what i've written a lot about is the announcements for um from both china and india building out their um their coal base like they're they're building more than a, a coal plant every um they're building two coal plants every week um india is set to increase their entire coal fleet by at least a quarter if, um, by 2030, and China's wow. has approved and under construction a quarter. And if it was to have everything planned, um, be permitted, it would be nearly a third. And these are the two biggest coal uh, consumers in the world. Yeah. So. Well, that's excellent <laughs> news. If you own coal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Certainly is. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, so moving on to coal, uh, DS4 wants to know, do you ever see uh, thermal coal reaching over 300 bucks again? Probably not. It's, that was a pretty unique setup. Um, you, you do sort of do have a free call option with um, all these guys with the, the tight correlation between um, a lot of the, like, the higher quality, like Newcastle and TTF. Um, so if if you got like a an absolute freezing winter with no wind in Europe, you could see some pretty interesting um, price action. Uh, but no, that's, that's not the base case. And if anything, I think uh, people's expectations um, out of coal stocks got a bit a bit carried away on the back of the Russia um, sort of invasion. And coal for me was always a story of just absolute bombed out, unloved. Um, never, never be re-rated, and they all just um, just pay fat dividends and hoover up their own stock. It's kind of the, the tobacco story. Um, no one will ever touch it, and you'll you'll look at it after a few years, and you'll be like, shit, that that performance really compounded and um, was off ninety nine percent of people's radar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone uh, hates it. Um, okay. And Trader wants to know how serious is the uh, pullback? So what we were just looking at here was thermal coal, and then we'll pull up met coal here. Um, how serious is this weakness in uh, in coking coal and met coal? So I, what he's talking about is recently we've come down here. You know we're above the three hundreds, and then now we're coming down to like two uh, uh, two seventy five. What uh, what do you see here with met coal? Um. I'm not much of a short-term trader with this. I, I see a I'm pretty bullish on Met Coal um, for the long run, really. And the, 
for a few reasons. One is the fact that it's quite scarce globally when you consider the um, a lot of sort of whether it's India, Indonesia, China um, have massive ability to produce thermal coal, but high quality um, coking coal, met coal um, reserves are, are reasonably limited, and oh, the, the big ones really are um, Russia. Australia, US, and um, and Mongolia, and with US and Australia doing everything to kind of cut um, cut financing, make it hard to permit, just the whole ESG doing our best to sort of crimp supply, and I see that as just really putting a bit in on it longer term. Obviously, Russia's got its issues with yeah, who will accept it, and Mongolia's largely got um, transportation issues of getting it out. Um, and so um, I think it, it's just a great uh, supply side story because with, um, obviously with thermal, it's obviously a lot easier to mine. Um, it's more sort of like quality mets generally deeper underground. So you've got more capex, um, longer sort of um, longer time to bring, bring it to production and with the higher capex, it's it's more limited by um, what we're seeing across a lot of the um, in Australia. They're just all the Australian banks are just stopping financing coal, so they've either got the they've got got the sort of the cash flow internally to do it, or otherwise, um, yeah, it, it's um, increasingly difficult. And the other side of met, which I didn't appreciate, and this kind of kind of got sucked in by a bit of a narrative of China um, and the property sort of market being in trouble there and potentially uh, going to have sort of a, a global financial crisis or a, ha, have run into, come really unstuck and drag down um, sort of steel demand and damaged met coal from there. I largely think that view was wrong they seem more than capable of managing it. And also, if they quite bullish the rest of the developing world now that they're, um, they're starting to finance a lot more of their trade in their own currencies, which is which is massively bullish um, across the developing world. I was, I was super surprised to see that 20% of trade last year was in non-USDs for oil, which is, it was, it was really the main sort of, constraining factor for a lot of developing countries is getting access to the US dollars to buy the commodities they need. And so when they can start doing deals with China and Russia to get the commodities and the energy they need in their own currency, then we could really see um, a lot of growth and that would definitely play into um, steel demand and net coal demand by default. And so I think I was overly bearish on potential for China to mess it up and now I've kind of switched the other way and see demand actually been pretty robust um, for Met Coal for a long runway. Okay, so you see uh, uh, Met Coal long term is, uh, is should do quite well. And um, I also heard you sprinkle in yep. there that the, the, the petrodollar is dying. 20% <laughs> of transactions are not done in the US yeah. dollar anymore. Thank you to uh, our Uncle Sam. Yep. Uh, Russia got its reserves um, confiscated. <laughs> so, yeah, the, every other developing country is like, okay, we'll we'll start um, we'll start making sure that doesn't happen to us and uh, start skirting around the US dollar where possible. Yeah, yeah. I watched an interview uh, from Tucker Carlson and uh, Putin, and in there, I believe mm. Putin said before he got the sanctions from. Uh, uh, from the U.S., they were transacting, I think, thirty-six uh, percent in in dollars, like you know, foreign trade. And after the sanctions, thirteen percent. So that's just one country there. Uh, collectively, I got to believe that all of them are looking at that and going, "Wow, are we next?" <laughs> they're going to start. That's they're going to start buying and selling and something else. That's it. Well, yeah. We're, it's um, it's the rule of law. It's why the West has been so successful. And so, as soon as you, um, as soon as you start taking stuff with no, like, yeah, that that's what <laughs> that just breaks the entire trust 
dynamic and you better believe that Saudis and China and everyone uh, um, are looking at US like having seen them just do this to to Russia think okay well um, my my real estate in Western countries or my my treasuries aren't as safe as I thought they were right yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay uh, continuing on with coal any thoughts on um, uh, BTU P dot Peabody uh, yeah, I, I like it. I think it's, um, with, with my coal names, I'm just looking for one that, uh, growing production, whether by M&A, whether organically, and going to probably start focusing on buybacks because I, I see that it's just, it's pretty clear the, um, the returns that can be had by if the market won't lift the multiple on the company that generates a lot of cash flow then there's nothing better than it for it to sort of corner its own float like amrs displayed that pretty clearly and then you, you go around the um the coal space and you a few um companies have already started like peabody's already at um, i think it's already 11 percent of its float that's bought back and um and then yeah see them bringing on centurion which is going to add another maybe referred to their, um, their cash flow, And you're like, well, where's that gonna go? That's gonna go into the um, buybacks. That's that's pretty damn accretive if you consider that knocking out six, 700 million already and add another sort of 300 to that and they're only at a 3 billion um, odd market cap. Like <laughs> that's, yeah, doesn't take uh, much math to work out that that's um, that could get pretty interesting if they start pouring it into buybacks, um, especially once Elliot are out and um, as I said, Centurion's up and running, and just do the same, do the same maths with um, be it Warrior, be it um, be it Whitehaven. It, it's uh, I'm sort of fascinated by all of it, and um, just yeah, it doesn't doesn't take a rocket scientist to think that this this is a nice trend to be on. And um, and all the CEOs would be watching how creative it's been to the likes of um, Alpha um, AMR. Yeah. Yeah, AMR's had a nice pullback recently. Yeah, that was a good buy. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. <laughs> that was cool. Hope we get another one. <laughs> all we need is uh, Greta, Greta Thunberg to uh, make a comment or something, and maybe we'll get it another 50 bucks cheaper. So. <laughs> Um, okay. Have you looked into Corsica, uh, Corsica coal, a tiny company? I don't know if you've, have you seen it? Yeah, I, I have looked at it. I, um, I kind of passed on small coal companies cause I just didn't think the risk was, um, was necessary when, um, they're just any, anything that went wrong, they were going to have trouble sort of accessing finance. They didn't have the balance sheet to get them through. If they had any issues with permitting, any issues with the mine, um, any, yeah, they just wouldn't be able to access finance that easily. Um, kind of seen what's happened to, was it, um, so Alliance, Alliance, wasn't it? That, um, that went bust on the back of that. Just, um, Alliance resource just, partners. Um, yeah. Yeah. I believe, yeah. I believe that was the one that, um, they just couldn't access finance. It was really Peabody. Um, wasn't really cause it, um, it was just, they couldn't I believe they couldn't roll roll their debt at the time and that's why they were forced into chapter 11 it's just the market was um unwilling to lend to them at um sort of reasonable rates and so for that reason i kind of was like oh i'm sure it does well like it's a it's a great story i see them paying down their debt they're cash flowing quite well but um yeah i i just prefer to stick with the the larger plays um and yeah just feel a bit safer okay 20, 25 million market cap doesn't really get you excited. <laughs> no, no, not not in coal. And in, in other ones, that's where I hang out. But <laughs> well, maybe not twenty five million. That's that's pretty damn small. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and also, yeah, the um, at some point you got to give some of the um, the sort of the sort of what we call the the way it trades as well doesn't um, kind of get much confidence either. You do sort of do when you compare it to some of the, um, the other cold names, it's, um, it's got a lot more weakness. And I always kind of think there's, yeah, there can be information in that as well. It doesn't 
doesn't seem to rally when other cold names rally in and um, has a lot more weakness. So yeah, I it's that was been a pass for me, even though I, I can see the bull case pretty clearly with it. Okay, okay, just a little bit too small and doesn't respond mm-hmm. to the to the market like the other ones do. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that answers James, Antonio, Dale, uh, Ben. Um, okay, so Whitehaven bought the um, uh, Donia and Blackwater uh, Met Coal mines from BHP and Mitsubishi. Uh, that was in October. And um, mm-hmm. uh, what are, what are your thoughts on the Whitehaven ac- acquisition after um, after what is that? Uh, you know, six months have passed. Oh, I love it. Yeah, no, I think that's the the perfect way to um, to expand your asset base. Like it's. BHP was selling that not for economic reasons. They wanted it off their balance sheet, really, so that they could focus on like called transition metals. So essentially become more ESG friendly, get a higher multiple. And um, and yeah, really, really dump the assets. And so it's similar to what we've seen with um, other few names, be it Anglo-American sort of um, spinning out Fungella. That was just a a massive outperformer after that. And I think I think White Whitehaven's gonna be similar. I think um I mean yeah even we, we might get um some news in the next month or so how accretive it is when you consider they're just doing a mini auction at the moment um for selling I believe twenty percent of Blackwater. And so it'll be interesting what price that fetches. But if that's if that if that's even close to their sort of cash outlay that's that's gonna be crazy. That will be um, the idea that they could could do the deal with. Uh, so they had to put up a billion, um, got the bridging loan of um, a billion, and then the rest is kind of paid out from the cash flow from the asset. If they can get their cash back from taking a twenty percent slice off Blackwater and then clean up the bridging loan with cash flow and then just pay their section of the cash flow, that to me is just a ridiculously good deal and then hopefully once all this um this financing is cleaned up then back to buybacks which is what they were doing previously and um uh, it's pretty beneficial for stocks so it's um yeah double I, I don't see any issues with it at all and i don't know why there was the sort of negativity towards it maybe the last few months yeah i just think people are too short-sighted okay okay really good for whitehaven bhp was trying to uh be a little politically correct, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yep, yeah. All right. Um, what, what do you think of Glencore and their uh, uh, tech uh, deal? Uh, that's interesting because um, I see they're having. I read an article a few days ago that they're actually um, sort of starting to consider keeping it in house. When originally, when they picked up, um, it, it was going to split into a transition. Um, transition Glencore and they were going to spin out the coal assets and that was more I think it was still a few years out that was talking of spinning out the assets like 25 26 into a, a separate coal entity um, which yeah be all over that if that got spun out um, but yeah I, I, I just find it fascinating the interplay between so I've, I've, I've written a piece on this and just call it sort of fantasy demand versus um, real demand and what, what I was trying to get at was coming right back to my point about, I believe, the EV adoption is going to um, disappoint and also the, um, the, the sort of the build out of 50% renewables by 2050. I think both of them are going to disappoint. And with them, a lot of the projections of all the materials needed for those transitions will disappoint. So a lot of the majors will have completely thrown all their capex and geared themselves towards demand projections that don't end up um, eventuating. And what will eventuate is the growth in developing countries, um, be it um, living standards, be it AC. Um, That's the big sort of demand driver that no one ever seems to talk about. And that'll all be um, highly beneficial to coal. So the very thing that they've got off their balance sheets was what um, where all the value would be for the next decade. And um, th- there's a lot of history of this. Whenever anyone does anything more for sort of an ideology, usually it um, doesn't prove to be correct over 
uh, a long stretch. Okay. Uh, moving on to gold and silver. Um, Warren Buffett wants to know, <laughs> planning <laughs> to reallocate uh, to gold or coal when he sells his uranium stocks? What, um, uh, what, what, what do you think you'll be transitioning out when, when you do exit uranium? Do you think it'll be into the precious metals or what, what you have to wait and see? Yes, I'm, I'm putting a whole lot of ideas on the shelf at the moment. So I've got, I've got some that I've, um, some that are quite clear cut that I just know I'm going to continue building out. Um, a lot of that's in the offshore service space. I just see stupid amount of value there, just cents on the dollar stuff that has, will be very difficult to replace. I kind of call it, um, so just big moats around it. I'm trying to get up to speed on gold currently because I do I do think I was probably wrong on, I've been pretty negative on gold the last few years. I haven't owned a single gold or silver stock. And my main, my main issue was just the sort of the political nature of gold, like the, the paper market, um, always seemed to expand there was no real price discovery and i was just like I, I don't want to be um involved in a market where there can't be true price discovery um and so i just um stuck with energy now what's changed that is just seeing this consistent um premium in um shanghai gold price and so it's kind of like talk about it as in the cartoon of there's a fence and there's chinese throwing um, paper money over one side and then there's um, us in the west from London exchange uh, London and New York throwing gold back <laughs> and um, they're just sucking out all the physical and they're sitting on an awful lot of gold and at some point um, it makes sense for them to to like all that that is in itself take it slowly taking out the paper market and at some point could um, significantly revalue and so coming to that conclusion is obviously in really large embedded call option and gold at some point in the future. And if they're using it for settlement as they're starting to gold, gold's a small market compared to the rest of the sort of commodity space. And so that additional demand for it could, um, could really yeah, send it running. So I've kind of changed my tune on gold and I'm just trying to work out like, like for anyone, my own, my, like my framework is really where's the most quality with like the highest um, a higher um, production cost that's been absolutely bombed out really hated like what does the market think is completely uneconomic and what I'm seeing will bring it um, will bring it back considerably um, make it quite profitable sort of a call cool option um, of a mind without having to go into juniors or anything too speculative Okay, so you've been out of the gold trade, um, but uh, you're starting to see some, uh, I guess, an arbitrage uh, between uh, the <laughs> London's Metals Exchange and and, uh, and Shanghai. And if Shanghai is willing to pay an extra 100 bucks an ounce for it, guess where the gold's going? It's going to China. Exactly. <laughs> uh, th this may be piquing your interest a little bit. And if you see an opportunity in, uh, in a hated uh, gold miner where you can leverage uh you might take it yep yep no that's that's exactly it i'm kind of bouncing between the metals whether it's silver gold even i find palladium um and platinum quite interesting as a sort of a, a counter to the um views that ice vehicles won't be required and evs are taking off it's kind of um i find that interesting and i also find tin and tin and interesting so i'm Kind of juggling those all in my head and trying to work out which is um which is the most attractive or maybe i end up with all of them in the portfolio um in the future again okay um this is a market i haven't paid attention to i'm going to share my screen here and uh but um tin uh i've mm -hmm. <clears throat> never really looked at tin i think i may have pulled up this chart once a year ago or something but uh uh, do you follow the tin market? I do. Yeah, I, okay. I like it. What, uh, what mm -hmm. do you see in tin here? Johnny wants to know about uh, uh, supply gap seems to be coming critical. Uh, he's talking about X metals and then traders talking about uh, alpha men. Um, here's X metals. 
Alpha men, what uh, g- give us a one on one on uh, 10. I don't know anything about 10. Yeah, certainly. So the um, demand for about 50% of all demand is, um, is soldering, we call it kind of metal glue. Okay. And so this is, um, it's kind of the unsung hero of electrification. If, if, you, if you want the cleanest play on electrification, it would have to be tin because it's, it's only a few um, cents in every electric um, product, but it's completely um, sort of irreplaceable. It's, it's one of the more, um, one of the cleanest ways and one of the smallest markets as well, which is um, where I got, kind of got drawn into it at, at first as well. I was like, this is, this is fascinating. And then when you dig into it, like a lot of the demand where I went wrong originally was um, not understanding the amount of how closely it ties to electronic demand. And so there was a massive boost of that during COVID. So with us all being locked at home, a lot of kids being homeschooled, everyone had to have a laptop per kid, had to really gear up on electronics. That's why there was that so, huge spike on that chart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So, and so... A good, a good proxy for it's actually just looking at semiconductor demand. And so in, in 2020, semiconductors uh, proof, I believe the market um, went up 50%, um, increased 50%. And then on the back of COVID, it got trashed. It um, fell like a quarter. And so tin got dragged with it. And so that's why that was kind of had that um, boom and bust. And I didn't really appreciate that. Um, so that, that's the demand side. And, and from there, I see the demands like semiconductors are coming back to use that as a proxy. They're um, nearing all time highs again. Obviously, it's all we hear about now with um, AI and um, the growth of electronics. It's something that probably a reasonably robust um, trend, um, a way to play that trend, anyways. It's like the electrification um, and essentially computers being added to everything. But where tin gets really interesting is um, how messed up the supply side is and how few players there really are involved. So um, one of the the larger players is um, Myanmar, and that's um, that's where China imports an awful lot of their tin to um, smelt and refine it. And they they started off with some great... um, great deposits back in 2014 and since then they've absolutely high graded um really heavily and more recently they've um they've essentially cut off access to it um china and it was I think it was like it's about 15 percent of um of the global tin um resource that that it's been high graded there is yeah <laughs> Although think it's coming back, the um, and that that's a massive hit. And then at the same time, um, China, where it's trying to make up that loss of that tin, is via Indonesia. And now Indonesia is an interesting story as well because they've decided that they're going to um, try and withhold all exports of more raw materials and try and have more value add within the um, within Indonesia and so they they've been starting to restrict exports they're um, also really coming down on illegal mining here and so recently there's been um, no it's yeah it's more due to permitting and regulation but there's been almost um, no tin out of um, Indonesia I believe the last month or two it's granted that will bounce back and just to top it all off um, the yeah, a lot of the sort of the reserves are actually quite short. There isn't um, much mine life left in, um, in Indonesia. Um, as I said before, Myanmar has actually pretty much worked through their entire sort of reserve and no one knows where <laughs> where this um, supply demand gap is going to come from. So sort of coming back to like almost the uranium story and it's such a small market, it just doesn't get any attention. It doesn't, uh, no one really talks about it. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I kind of find it fascinating because it's kind of hard to, uh, there is a tin association, it's a great website. They try and keep everyone updated and 
put out a lot of um, of good information, but really the um, just the supply side is going to have to matter at some point. Uh, and yeah, I've I've had it on the shelf because I wanted to see the froth go out of the um, the demand um, like yeah the demand side and really start to um, really start to bike again and it's something I've kind of kept my eye on and I really like what I'm seeing now with some of them even engaging in sort of buybacks like the middle of sex because they're, they're trading that's the other thing you're not buying a lithium company where you had some crazy multiple in the EV boom this some of the stuff trading cheaper than coal <laughs> I think wow. I looked at metals X the other day and it was EV to EBITDA of 1.9 times and they're actually just talking about buying back 10% of their stock so pretty pretty damn interesting really you said you and, said metals and, x yeah okay yeah i don't i don't own it it's just it's still sort of on the shelf just deciding what's the most attractive um players but really when you look around the sector there's really only two i think i've, I've got a presentation from um a year or two ago and it, i kind of go through the whole tin sector um and just derive it the only two that make any sense really are metals X and Alphaman. And then the problem with Alphaman is it's got an absolute amazing resource, but it's in the DRC. So you can't um, you can't load up on that. Yeah, it's like yeah. Ivanhoe is yeah. like, man, I really want to bet on that, but I just can't get my head out like it's in the Congo. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah, in the so meantime, that, since I, you know, it, it's doubled and I'm like, well, I guess I should have had it at six bucks. I don't know. <laughs> Awesome. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Ferg. Uh, if uh, someone wanted to get a hold of you and uh, follow you on Substack, what what can they expect? Um, so on Substack, I send out a sort of a weekly email um, with the I call it Ferg's finds. It's just the best article, podcast, quote, chart, tweet, and something I'm pondering. So that's sort of a free. Um, free email I send out weekly. And then the subsects is pretty much what I'm doing with my portfolio, what I'm interested in, what I'm buying, what I'm selling. Um, and yeah, analyzing sectors to see where the big opportunities are. If anyone wants to reach me, I guess it would be my email at ferg at traderferg.com. And I don't use Twitter that much anymore. I've kind of really dialed that back, but um, occasionally I check my DMs. So yeah, those would be, those would be the ways. Mm. Okay, awesome. Well, um, we will put a link in the pinned comment below to your uh, uh, to your sub stack. Uh, so thank you for coming on the show, Ferg. This was a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed it. Yes. And thank you for always being here. Check out Ferg's work in the link below. Hit the like and subscribe and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy. They can't stop talking about tech stocks. Have yourself a great rest of the day, and we will talk to you next time.